In today's episode, we are thrilled to have Mark Lance, the Vice President from GuidePoint Security, as our special guest. In this deep dive discussion, we explore the intriguing world of ransomware, shedding light on how sophisticated these organizations have become and the methods that they employ to recruit top talent. Furthermore, we delve into the harrowing realities of real-time cyber attacks, emphasizing the crucial role of expert negotiators and examining the aftermath that victims and organizations face in the wake of such attacks. So without further ado, let's jump in. Thanks for joining Secure Insights, Mark. Thanks for taking the time. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Excellent. Did you want to just give us a quick brief sort of overview as to what your role looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Mark Lance. I'm a vice president for GuidePoint Security's um, digital forensics, incident response, and threat intelligence practice here at GuidePoint. So Dealing with everything from reactive incident response, um, involving ransomware, business email compromise. Um, we've got a ton of experience with, you know, APT and nation state sponsored threats to proactive compromise assessments, advisory services around tabletops, playbooks, run books, uh, and, uh, you know, do a lot of content development with our threat intelligence team, as well as have a services portfolio there as well. Uh, the whole end to end good stuff okay um and we we wanted to talk so do a bit of a deep dive really didn't we into sort of the, the ransomware um world uh, which is obviously you know very close to to you and your guys um and then sort of move into you know the real time attack and what that, what that looks like the outcomes prevention yeah. um some of the sort of the left and right turns so in in terms of what you're seeing uh, you know individually from from you know within the organization and just generally being out sort of at, you know in in on ground level what what's the current most common ransomware attacks that you're currently seeing in the industry yeah i mean i think from the ransomware perspective the the big thing is is just the volume that we're seeing right now so we mm. recently just were well sorry we're getting ready to publish our our um you know 2023 ransomware report just kind of mm giving you a summary of everything that we saw across 2023 but i think the the idea there is that um the volumes that we've seen from 22 to 23 um as an industry we all kind of agree that in 2022 there was a bit of a lull um mm -hmm. 2022 2021 was like some of the highest volumes of ransomware that we've historically seen more victims more publications of these victims to these different you know threat groups name and shame sites yeah. Um, and then in 2022, whether that was, you know, the certain aspects of the Russia Ukraine conflict, whatever else we can only hypothesize, we agree as an industry, we saw a lull. Now, by no means does that mean it ever stopped. Like it was still mm -hmm. very prevalent. There was still, you know, you know, a ton of victims and people being impacted by it, but it just wasn't the same volume we had historically seen. Mm -hmm. 2023, 2023 started out with a bang. And it's mm -hmm. just continued ever since the volume starting in initial of 2023 through, you know, the very end and into 2024 are not only the same rates we saw in 2021, but even more. And I think, you know, again, we can hypothesize on why I think it's because honestly, it's extremely lucrative for these mm -hmm. threat actors. They're making a ton of money. So and we're just seeing them hit, you know, certain industries. We're sitting, seeing them hit, you know, certain types of targets, but yeah, it's extremely prevalent and, and, you know, really kind of using zero days using um you know, publicly facing vulnerabilities you know uh purchasing access via the dark web a lot of different things that we're seeing and is there um i mean in terms of platforms and and that you're seeing mostly here where, what does that look like yeah i mean so we have seen some kind of changes there um you know a lot of historically once they get into the environment i mean it, it really kind of is the same recipe that you see over and over again with these with these ransomware incidents mm -hmm. um they find an initial method to get in if you look at kind of the availability of different vulnerabilities across different platforms and everything else like there's so many different ways whether that's mass exploitation whether that's individual exploitation of a certain platform mm -hmm. that they can potentially get into these environments Mm -hmm. Historically, we see where, you know, it's vulnerabilities. Um, phishing still works. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we, we see customers get fished all the time, and that eventually leads to successful compromise. Mm -hmm. Open RDP to the internet. If you've got open RDP to the internet, shut that down. They're going to find a way to get in. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think the idea is that there's a lot of different methods that we see. Um, we do get questions all the time, like, 
oh, could somebody weaponize a binary on my home system and because I'm on my home Wi-Fi, then transfer it over to this system that's a working system and then upload it via the VPN because we left it open. It's like, yeah, you could do all that or you could just fish somebody because it's, you know, much easier. There's no need to reason, no reason to go all Hollywood. Like these kind of old traditional methods are still working because it does take time to patch systems when new vulnerabilities come out. There are development teams and engineers who set up, you know, rogue infrastructure maybe that you don't know about. So there's just, again, a lot of these traditional methods are, are mm -hmm. still working to gain initial access. And mm -hmm. then once they gain initial access, it's kind of the similar type thing. It's, you know, move laterally, yeah, elevate privileges. And then what they're going to do is they're going to find what first step for them after that, all of like kind of establishing themselves, set up multiple methods of persistence. If they get kicked out one way to make sure, pardon me, they can get back in another way. Um, They're going to try to then find their sensitive information in their environment. And then the final step for these threat actors is actually encrypting your system. Um, Because what they want to do is like, Again, even if you are able to recover because you've got viable backups and everything else, they're going to try to extort you through the data theft um, to try to get you to pay the ransom as well. Yeah. So, uh, lots but, of different methods. No, indeed, indeed, indeed. It's interesting. I mean, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Because, um, you know, the last 10 years, cybersecurity is really ramped up, isn't it, with, you know, in a, in a global capacity, especially the last, say, like, five to seven. Yet still those traditional methods uh, are what we sort of see at large um, or where most of the attacks sort of come from. So uh, I guess, you know, if you're talking to organizations and corporates, whether it's, you know, small to medium or, or your big or your big corporates, how can that change over the next three years? I mean, so, so three years from now, five years from now, are we still going to be looking at some of those traditional methods working or can that be closed down? What can, what can everybody do about it? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because I think that we've seen a lot of, um, I mean, we've been out there preaching about this stuff for years and years. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in incident response specifically for about 15 years um, in my career over 22. Mm -hmm. And and like you said, over that time period, we're still seeing a lot of the same methods for mm -hmm. additional entry. Now, I'll, again, it's it's different exploits being used. It's, it's different, you know, methods within those kind of, broader categories that are being used um but yeah it's it's where we have been kind of getting customers to pay attention is on the fundamentals and the basics mm. so not everybody is going to be a master class and like hey here's our level of sophistication and maturity when it comes to cybersecurity. we can identify you know successful you know successful email compromise within a matter of minutes mm. and able to take steps to block that or prevent that and so not everybody has that cybersecurity funding and availability. So what mm. we recommend is really, again, kind of just focusing on the basics. And to me, the basics, and I think we're seeing this and we're seeing some of these trends like push from cyber insurance. Um, they're now saying, hey, you've got certain insurability requirements. And so yeah. there are things like not only technologies. So like you should absolutely have an EDR. You should have, you know, centralized log management. You should have MFA enabled. Like those are three absolute minimums. But then outside of technology-based solutions, um, you also need to have policies and documentation in place. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to have things like, um, you know, acceptable usage policies. You need to have an IR plan. So when something does occur, people know their roles and responsibilities and how to respond. And then you've got to practice those things with like tabletops. And that yep. is, again, I think just to mention insurance again, like they're driving a lot of those positive trends because it's mm. things we've said for a year, like have the minimums and have your minimums, not only be technologies, you have to have the process and then the supporting people. And now they're coming in and saying, Hey, well, we're not even going to insure you from a cyber insurance perspective, unless you have these minimums. So I think that's driving a positive trend from a, a fundamental or a core requirement. And I think for a lot of these threat actors, some of those simple things are, well, what, you know, if you if they're trying to exploit a certain thing and you're not a, you're not vulnerable to it or maybe you they're able to get access but you've got mfa in place maybe mm. that's enough for them to say ah you know what this one's too much trouble i'll move on to the next one now for the next threat actor that might not be too much or they might look at a different method but 
again, some of those fundamentals could ro lower your your kind of risk profile um, to those threat actors substantially. Yeah, and we're we're seeing a lot uh, of movement in the cybersecurity um, realms of things as well, where they're refusing to um, ensure organisations unless you, you know, they they have those type of things you just mentioned in place. Um, are you seeing sort of um, a bit of a ramp up in sort of education and training as well? Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm. That stuff's absolutely critical. And we, we tell people all the time, like when you do user awareness training, don't just show people like, Hey, here's how to identify, you know, a malicious email, show yep. them here's how to identify a malicious email, but then give an example of like, this was a malicious email that specifically read, led to a, you know, $10 million ransom demand. And the client ended up having to pay, you know, two to $3 million in services and support yeah. to, address the incident and then potentially still even pay the ransom like show them like yeah it's all just starts with a simple click but mm. the end result of that single click is a multi-million dollar expenditure to us as a business it's affected our brand we're having to do notifications there's been data leakage like getting them to understand that the other thing on the user awareness side that we're huge advocates for is like don't punish people for you know reporting incident or don't have that culture of like oh man i clicked on this now if i report it am i gonna get in trouble it's like mm -hmm. nah, get in front of that mm -hmm. like advocate like hey if these things occur and you do report it incentivize people like i don't know if it's gift cards or what but like mm -hmm. incentivize kind of this um opinion of like hey let's be proactive about this stuff yeah that's a bit of a culture change isn't it would you say yeah, most yeah. definitely yeah okay yeah we're seeing some horror stories um and like you say uh some of the basics if that can be applied then then you probably see less of them um so we we spoke before didn't we about some of the ransomware brands and um and and trends and so on and and the groups um that are out there and how sophisticated that they are um how they're made up how they've splintered off um some of some have sort of come and gone um, and just generally how advanced that they are as, you know, organizations, they've got sort of real, you know, a real setup. Isn't it? This isn't an individual sitting in sort of, you know, the, the back end of, a, of, of you know, a, a country and um, with four four screens. This is this is a sort of a, a proper organization um, with, you know, professionals working. What, what from your, you know, because you're you're in the, uh, you know, you, you see this uh, regularly. Um, what what do they look like? How do they act? Yeah, so I mean, it it varies. So in 2023, we tracked over um, 60 different threat groups, ransomware groups specifically, mm. and e even some of those nowadays, people might be more inclined to even call them um, extortion based groups because some of them aren't even doing the encryption anymore; they're just stealing information and then trying yep. to extort people payments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there are significant difference in the in the types of groups. And we have a whole taxonomy that we use to really try to track them from like, hey, these are basically long term groups who've been around for a long time. You've got splinter groups, which are maybe kind of, you know, spun off of one of those larger groups and but don't have the longevity yet or kind of the history. You've got mm -hmm. your ephemeral groups and the ones that are just popping up right now. Um, and maybe we've seen them even like. Hit a couple, hit a couple victims, have a campaign, and then they shut it down, and we never hear from them again. So we've got kind of mm. a, we've got a taxonomy that we use to categorize all of these groups and and some of their sophistication levels and their longevity. Mm. And I think to your point, um, I don't think a lot of clients, when we initially speak with them, understand the the level of sophistication and maturity that they have. I mean, these are. These are multi-billion dollar organizations in some circumstances. Yep. Um, we can talk about Conti. Conti was a group that was extremely relevant, um, you know, a couple of years ago. They operated for roughly a year and a half um, as Conti, but during that period made over $2 billion, billion with a B. So, mm -hmm. I mean, when we talk about this being extremely lucrative and then making money, yep. um, this is why we continue to see the growth here. But, I mean, we see instances where, you know, we see uh, requests for uh, CVs out on the dark web and they're interviewing people for the different components in the, in the different portions of their teams. Um, so one of the, like ransomware as a service is one of the more kind of uh, like 
more commonly used models this day these days. So like yeah. Lockbit's a perfect example of that. Um, with their land, ransomware but as a service model, they have what's you know their affiliate program, and it's clearly defined on their website. Here's what our affiliate program is. It requires references and people that you've worked against in the past. We've got very strict rules that you have to adhere to if you want to be an affiliate. But as part of joining our affiliate program and using our ransomware as a service platform, we now are we're going to just take fifty percent of whatever ransom payments you've made. Um, and so, but within that platform, you have full access to do everything you need as part of the ransomware. You can get you know, everything from initial access mm. to you know, de- getting the binaries, deploying the ransomware. Once that victim reaches out to you, you can do all of your negotiations within that platform. You can, you know, accept payments. Um, you can issue issue decryptors if that's what you decide to do. And again, it's all centralized within this fully fledged platform that has a client queue. It's got response times. It's got that chat interface. And so it's like, again, we're not talking about something that was just like, scripted within a matter of hours we're talking about a fully fledged platform that has development teams engineering and qa teams um we've seen where you know a client is impacted by ransomware and the decryptor didn't necessarily work the first time so we see them escalate through levels of their support team um on their website they've got you know links to for for pr and media if you want to reach out to them directly and speak with them so i mean these are fully fledged businesses with different kind of organizational components, leadership, everything else. They just happen to be criminal. So, so, yeah, so the, the, the so, there is, is extremely uh, high. I mean, that's amazing. So with that, with that, you know, they're 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 really exposing themselves then in a lot of ways that perhaps you know some years ago that they didn't. Um, and I was going to ask you actually how they attract talent, how they attract people to work for them. Um, and and maybe some years ago it was a little bit like you say, um, you know, on the on the dark web and, and all that kind of stuff, or whether there's some sort of referral and or networking program going on. Um, are, are they taking people who are in you know mainstream, in the mainstream you know organisations, worlds, and how are they attracting them to work on that side? Then is is it is it because there's no rules is it because it's exciting for them Are they they paint an exciting picture is it money is it both yeah i think it i think it probably varies mm. i think that it, a lot of times we talk about like these larger groups maybe there's like a splinter component where um some individuals decide to break off and go do their own thing and that could be for monetary reasons it could be because of leadership based reasons or other business reasons mm. but i mean and so there's some maybe having referrals and references within the business or people you know that you want to work with. I think that, you know, there's tracking of certain types of individuals that are believed to work across actually multiple groups. Yeah. Um, you know, so and maybe you're, you know, affiliated with one group, but then there's separate affiliations with other groups. And so I think we've seen instances where people have been victimized and maybe they were just in the need of money and they're claiming that they didn't know that they were working for a ransomware group to perform this. Um, but they were attracted on the dark web, said they'd make $100 an hour for working on this. Um, yeah. it, it it really, I think, varies. I think that, again, they they lean on um, they lean on the anonymity, ability for supplemental income, ability for, and again, we're just hypothesizing. And yeah, yeah, here. yeah, yeah. But I mean, from an organizational structure, the people in the lower levels probably aren't making very much. They're probably... Mm. Um, maybe those are the people who are desperate for money. Maybe those are the people with the, you know, lesser trade skills, who knows? Mm. Um, and, and I think a majority of the money is going to the people in the top tier, but yeah, I think there's all sorts of kind of levers they could pull or switches they could flip, you know, trying to get people to work for them. And, and it could be intriguing for a lot of different people, depending on where you're at, yeah. what sort of availability, the technology and your, your, you know, regional job market. It could, could it be all of those things yeah and is there any kind of like system in you know out there or is there anything that you see where there's things being done to track those people down to to try to educate that you know perhaps you know the turning they've made is not a good one it's very dangerous if you know if we get hold of you this is what's going to happen and are they being caught you know is there consequences do we see that yeah i think that that's it's distinctly different by region i think you've yeah. got like um here, you know, within the 
within the U.S., I think there's a huge advocacy to work with law enforcement and share as much information as possible so that they can continue their investigations and mm. poten potentially um, leverage their information and, and access to information to make arrests or to, to have impacts that are, you know, hopefully trying to take down some of these places. And I think they work with other regional law enforcement and countries um, to do a lot of that type of stuff. But then I think you've got other countries that some maybe have a tendency to turn a blind eye because, you know, maybe there is local or government support for some of the, the yeah. things that are occurring in Eastern Europe, -based, Eastern European based countries for maybe they are fu helping fund the government with some of the output of some of this stuff because they're making money. Or again, maybe they're turning a cold sh shoulder to it and just, you know, Hey, we're not really going to pay attention to it. But I think for the most part, um, those with the idea of helping try to stop these kinds of things yeah. have a, a, a tendency to, to go out and advocate for, you know, here's why you shouldn't be doing it. And, and, uh, it's, it's the ones that you can't reach or that, that are actually doing that sometimes seem to be the problem. Yeah. I think we, we all know which countries might be behind it. We won't say which ones though. Um, okay. <laughs> so if we take a real time attack then, Mark, and um, you know something's kicked off, it's happened, um, whichever way it's come through. Um, what what do you? What's a typical plan for, for for you know in your experience? What what happens? So you know you get the call if it's one of your customers or or, or um, a previous one. Um, how does it all set off? Yeah. So I mean, for the most part. Um you know, we either get kind of ad hoc escalations or clients yeah. who've had us on a retainer or like, Hey, you know, we've had something occur. We need your support. Or it's yep. again, like I said, ad hoc, it's like, Hey, we have heard of you guys found your name and information. We've got something going on. We went to your website um, to report an incident, whatever. Yeah. Step one is, is, you know, getting access to, to our team so that we can into their resources together collaboratively so that we can hop on a call. Yeah. I mean, we really just need to understand like, Hey, how did you identify what's going on? What actions and steps have been taken to this point and kind of where things currently sit? Yeah. Um, and a majority of time in these situations, it, in ransomware, unfortunately, a lot of times it's like, hey, we found ransom notes on our systems. And that is kind of the more common theme is like ransom notes are popping up on, on these servers or these systems. It says, go to this website to find out how much the ransom amount is. We've taken your data, um, you know, start communicating with us or we're going to publish this information. And so that's where it all starts. And so from our our side, it's, you know, understanding like, hey, okay, what visibility did you have in place? Because we need to perform an investigation. Yeah. Um, we've got to figure out, you know, how they initially got into the environment. Um, once they got in, what steps did they take to, whether that's to set up persistence, whether that's to, to find information and expel information. Um, and then if they did access certain things, exactly what it is they did access, because then in parallel to clients escalating to us, they should be escalating to um, or performing or initiating conversations with external counsel yep. so that they can get some direct on what their disclosures and liabilities are going to be. And then potentially involvement from cyber insurance if they're going to have that. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to perform that investigation. We're going to feed that information, hopefully in collaboration with kind of Try party with external counsel so that the client can make determinations on on here. Here's what you need to do. Um, a lot of that is evidence based, though. Yeah, we've got clients who don't have solutions in place, or the attackers cleaned up after themselves. We might never find the confirmed method of ingress, how they actually got into the environment. But what's just as important is finding up all of those um, uh, those methods of persistence because. There's not an instance these days where a threat actor doesn't get up and say, get in and say, okay, well, now I'm going to start deploying tools. And what they like to do these days is they like to deploy legitimate tools, things that are mm -hmm. IT management solutions that when they show up in your environment, they're not going to trigger alerts like, oh, this is malware because it's not malware. It's legitimate IT management solutions. Yeah. So they, they like to deploy those in the environment, set up web shells so that if their initial access gets kicked off, oh, I just come back and be the IT management tool. I just come back in via the web show. And so they're not going away. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's like you say they set up five methods of persistence and you mm. only find four. Mm. Well, guess what? They're just coming right back into fifth and they're right mm. back to what they already know the environment. They've already been in there. They've already done what they need to do. 
so that's why it's drastically important to like understand uh how they got in so that that front door can be shut but then any side doors that they've also unlocked or or holes or, or other ways yeah. that they've set up and then also again understanding what information they have took that's part of just the investigative piece obviously if you're trying to recover operations and restore operations if there were was actually encryption going on at the mm -hmm. same time mm -hmm. so you've got to prioritize that in addition to the investigation yeah but as part of all that as well you've at some point got to reach out to that threat actor now by saying you i don't mean necessarily the client should be doing that um we do um threat actor communications and negotiations as well where a lot of times you want to use somebody who's an expert and has experience negotiating terms and working with these threat actors um, because there's a ton of value in initiating communications, regardless of their, whether there's any attempt to make a ransom payment. You need to establish communication with them so that you can understand ransom amount. You can potentially get information about the incidents. There's certainly significant benefit in engaging somebody to assist with the threat actor communications and negotiations. Yeah. Um, regardless of whether there's any intent on actually making a ransom payment, mm -hmm. there's such significant uh, there's such significant value that comes from engaging that threat actor. Um, one, I mean, it can help delay the initial timelines that they've established that say, oh, if you don't get back with us in 48 hours, we're going to publish this information. Well, even now engage them and now mm -hmm. as, through those communications, you can reestablish or, or extend those timelines to publication if you don't end up making the ransom payment. Mm -hmm. But then there can also be things like, you know, uh, getting confirmation on, on what they've taken from the environment that they believe is valuable. Yeah. Um, so getting access to the file trees, um, but also the ability to negotiate terms like say you do actually need to make a ransom payment for whatever reason. Maybe it's because you don't have viable backups. Maybe it's because you do want to prevent that data disclosure and, you know, on their terms and yeah. then be able to do it on your own terms through, you know, external legal counsel. Maybe it's just to, to again, because there is no intent, it's just strictly to delay so that you have time to perform that forensic investigation. But there's a ton of value there in engaging them um mm -hmm. so that you can feed you know other work streams as as part of your um investigation and and really something that should occur from you know a, a professional negotiation team yeah and in your your experience in mark what what sort of percentage do you see organizations um taking that that route where you know they'll they'll bring either they'll they'll, they'll have a um a contract with um yeah, guys like yourself, um, perhaps if they don't, um, are there organizations out there that, that wouldn't sort of go down that route and wouldn't bring a sort of professional negotiating team in place? And they're sort of a little bit vulnerable there then, aren't they? Yeah, I, I think more commonly than not, you see the usage of um, kind of expert threat actor communications and negotiations or, or teams like ourselves to perform those activities. Yeah. I think historical, um, and we've had instances where, you know, client is is impacted by ransomware a bunch of ransom notes and you've got you know bob from it who took this personally and goes ahead and reaches out to them is like <laughs> we've had funny <laughs> stories where like he's gotten on the, he, he's reached out to them and been like we're not gonna pay you a damn thing how could you ever do this to us <laughs> and then by the time it gets through to senior leadership or whatever and senior leadership is like nobody please reach out we get engaged. We then go and engage them. It's like, oh, yeah, by the way, we heard from Bob in your IT department and he didn't have very nice things to say to us. And we're like, oh, yeah, apologies. You know, he was he he was just re responding initially to the incident. But um, to your point, I think that it's more common than not that these days, because it's rare that somebody is impacted by ransomware and they mm -hmm. have the full capabilities in-house to deal with that. that. Yep. And there's there's almost always going to be involvement from external counsel when you are talking about something like this because they're going to help you determine you know um again disclosure requirements potential for litigation what the risks are a lot of times there's validation from an external ir firm and again with our expertise that's really some of what we're being brought to the table for is it's it's not just to respond to the incident and perform the forensics it's to help with the overall incident response methodology and kind of a establish expectations and and use our consulting to say hey if you haven't thought about it here's somebody that you would want to bring in or why you want to perform these types of activities in addition to these other things that you're performing and the values yeah. of those and so 
I think that's where, again, your, you know, your incident response teams are, are giving a ton of value is it's not just they're coming in to do the forensic work or should yeah. be in most circumstances. They're, they're really providing you kind of that expertise and overall methodology on, on what to expect. Yeah. And what, what percentage of organizations don't pay? Oh, it varies. Um, I would say, I think, and we've got this in our most recent um, ransomware report that's coming out. I th- I want to say that that over fifty percent of ransomware victims, or roughly fifty percent, have yeah. ended up making the payment. Um, okay. The investigations that we've worked, or where we've been the the threat actor communicator, and it's again, it it varies for different types of reasons that are you know the the, the business feels justified. Yeah. Um, that maybe again they don't have access to backups and they need the decryption keys to to get access to other things maybe yeah. it's strictly because they want to prevent that information from being published widely and publicly and so they'll they'll actually pay it maybe it's because the ransom amounts way less than they initially expected but then yeah. um but then it, on from that sense we've all got other clients who are vehemently opposed to it they're like we will absolutely not fund organizations that perform these types of activities i don't care what the impact is we're going to recover from it um so you know we'll initiate the communications with them but eventually we're just going to stop talking and we know that they're going to publish our information so i mean yeah. it really varies on the on the victim and what their desire is and, and what they need to do um we've got a lot of vict- or a lot of victims who will be like hey you know it's here's our here's what our budget is if we won or we're considering p- potentially making this and we're able to negotiate and get those terms and they're like well hold on if we can get method of ingress we can mm-hmm. get confirmation of deletion of data which i mean you know they delete it but if you know if they go sell it elsewhere who, who knows what happens behind the scenes mm-hmm. um, and then we can get a decryption keys so, sorry, we would potentially uh, you know make that payment <laughs> so yeah it really just it varies and i think that um yeah i think it really kind of you know 50 50 on 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 the engagements we've worked where they've ended up successfully negotiating the the ransom when the client wanted to but when they again i i think what's what's also interesting to call out is a lot of times we hear from from victims they're like once we make the payment how do we know we're actually going to get what we paid for yeah Uh, and look i'm not advocating for the threat actors here or anything else by any means Mm -hmm. but in the circumstances that we work, these criminal organizations also have a brand that they have to uphold. So say, you know, Lockbit is an example. Mm. Say if people are paying Lockbit consistently and Lockbit's messages, we'll give you decryption keys, we'll pro- we won't post your data, yeah. and we'll give you a bit of ingress. Yeah. Say all of a sudden people are paying, but they're not getting their access, their information decrypted and they're still selling the information somewhere else and you're finding it out there on the dark web. Well, the reputation is going to be don't pay Lockbit because we didn't get access back to our stuff. Yeah, and yeah. so they similarly have a reputation uphold, and we've actually seen where they will, you know, go through troubleshooting, like I mentioned earlier, to to make sure that they are getting you access back to your encrypted data. Yeah, because they don't want that reputation of if you pay us, we're not going to do what we say. Yeah. So yeah, and the and the ones then that have this sort of you know firm regardless of what happens we're not going to make a payment which is not going to we're not going to go down that road we'll 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 enter discussions but you know ultimately we're not doing that um uh, when does the sort of when does the pr plan come into that then because if they ultimately most of these things i guess is is you know customer data uh, a lot of the time um and if that is going to be you know out in the public domain and it's going to be out you know it's going to be published and it's going to be out in the public domain when do they you know, what's what's the what's the damage to them from a from a pr perspective yeah and that's um that's where we absolutely and kind of we're talking about it early like where mm. customer focus and what should some of the fundamental things that they work on be yeah um because you know exactly that um maybe they haven't thought about the aspects of like, well, hold on, when are we engaging external counsel? Do we have somebody to perform these types of communications and negotiations for us? Yeah. If we aren't going to pay, do we have policies for internal and external notifications? If it was this type of information, how is that going to affect us as a business versus, you know, say it was intellectual property or PII or, or PHI, if it's, you know, public health care. Um, so, those are things that customers should hopefully try to be 
thinking about proactively so that yep. when these things are occurring, they're not having to try to find the answers. They've already got a little bit of structure as, as to what's going on, but mm. it really varies by the business. We've seen, I've seen, you know, historically, and as part of my career, um, we worked with clients that were impacted, not necessarily by ransomware, but by, you know, APT groups and nation states um, that they gained access to intellectual property. They were then able to take that information and how things were developed, start doing it elsewhere in other countries. And we've seen those businesses shutter. Um, mm. And then, but specifically in regards to ransomware, I mean, I don't think there's the same stigma there has been historically. Um, it used to be, oh, we've been impacted by an incident. We've been impacted by ransomware. Don't talk about it. We don't tell anybody about it because it's going to look really bad about us as an organization. We've got all these closures to do and everything else. But now you see ransomware impacting everybody from the Fortune 50 yep. to mom and pop's pizza shop down the road. So I don't think that is that same kind of social stigma associated with it. But mm. I think what is still evaluated is how you respond to it um, and should be taken into account is like how you respond to it, you know, how you are informing people, notifying people. And I think those the way that people are responding is more going to affect their brand and reputation and require PR than, you know, the disclosure of information and everything else. I think that um, obviously there's steps, but I think legal is very good at, in making those and helping clients make those determinations. Well, this is the information that was stolen or potentially stolen. Here's what you have to do to notify clients yeah. or yeah. get them, you know, internal employees, whatever else. But yeah, it really varies depending upon the organization because we've seen horror stories where they've gotten everything from intellectual property and PII. And they're, that is one of the new things we're seeing these threat actors do too, is they're using more coercive tactics to say, instead of just saying, hey, we've got PII or, or sensitive information, we're going to release it if you don't tell us. They're mm -hmm. saying, oh, we specifically found out as you as a manufacturing company have had these accidents at these locations these people died and you paid out these sums. We're going to make that publicly available information and make you look terrible if you don't pay us. And so they are trying to use more of those coercive tactics. It's, you know, from mm. these threat actors perspective, anything they can do to get paid, they're yeah. going to try to. Yeah. So that makes sense a little bit because uh, like you say, you know, it's, it's, it's quite it's we're, we're quite used to it now aren't we um you know out, outside of where there's a, a breach um you know whether it's a <clears throat> whether it's a holiday organization a bank or hospitality a library which in the uk uh, i think it was about 18 months ago uh, got hit but so yeah and and yeah what do we do what do we do now do we sort of go oh my god is that my details with them uh, our details are sort of spread quite aggressively anyway i think out there uh, and it's it's harder and harder to to try to not be you know seen or or uh, be be uh, be found if you like um so i guess yeah the the attackers are, are having to become more sophisticated and more 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 reputation and brand damage they're gonna, they have to go to sort of further um uh, sort of you know further ideas which yeah um that that, that makes sense um where do you see it going in sort of you know to sort of conclude if you like then mark so that's you know that's what an organization will um will experience you know the, from the negotiating the, the the council the legal the public relations the general fallout you know all that kind of stuff um in terms of you know the next sort of three five years time do you see this looking very different, pretty similar? Um, you know, what what what's the what what can be what can be what can be done for for the organisations? Yeah, I I think that ransomware ransomware is not going anywhere. No. Uh, again, when we talk about how profitable it is and lucrative it is for these criminal organisations, um, I think that's why you are seeing more groups and just kind of this explosion of 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 certain types of activity is because they're making so much money off of it. And when you're making that much money, you're not just going to shut it all down and take it away from somebody. And then they're going to be happy about it. And it's not, it's not going to happen anymore. Um, so I think it's going to continue to be a problem. Mm. I like some of the direction that um, whether it's through insurance requirements or just it's, if it's the overall knowledge and opportunity to like get out there and speak about these kinds of things the clients are becoming more aware of it. Um, I think people are starting to take some of those more kind of core fundamental steps 
to protect themselves. Um, now that being said, that will drive the threat actors to continue to mature. Um, pardon me. Um, continue to evolve, and you know whether that's using things like we've seen over the last year, use more coercive tactics mm -hmm. um, or personalized tactics to gain act or to, to, sorry to try to get their um, ransom payment whether that is more targeted intrusion types because people are taking more cautious steps um, to protect themselves or, or leveraging more zero days or, or recently mm -hmm. released, released vulnerabilities, more supply chain type of tax. Like we, those are things we all see, but if people do become more sophisticated or mature, they're just going to continue to evolve to target them in different ways to make sure that they're continuing to get paid. So I think, that's really the direction we might see things going is um, as people become or or maybe are more standardized on a certain type of cybersecurity and, and uh, solutions and people and processes, um, we'll continue to see the threat actors evolve so that they can keep making money. And that could just mean, you know, more kind of targeted type of, type attack situations. Yeah, a mouse. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> great a, a great industry to be in um mark thank you very much for um for joining us really really appreciate it i know you've had a really busy uh, start to the year so thanks for your time yeah it's my pleasure man always enjoy uh getting to get out and talk about these things so really appreciate you guys having me excellent good stuff